thank you for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to present uh, Belgrade Surrealism here in Düsseldorf in the context of this exhibition. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to learn something about Egyptian Surrealism, which I knew very little before. And it's always interesting when you are researching certain topic to make a to compare it with similar things going on in other countries. So this is a big opportunity for me to broaden my knowledge of international surrealism. And it's a, also an honor to be here in this house, in this uh, respectable museum. Thank you very much once again for inviting me. Well, uh, Bergit surrealism is not an unknown topic uh, for the specialist in avant-garde or surrealist studies. Um, it is always mentioned in various international contexts when discussing surrealist movement, especially in France, of course, understandably. But also in the English-speaking countries like USA and UK, recently uh, there have been many studies shading new light on the surrealist heritage and Belgrade surrealism is always mentioned, but never discussed broadly. Uh, the main problem is that the key texts and um, publications, whether theoretical or poetry, uh, of Belgrade surrealists were never translated in, into English and some of them into French. So that's the main obstacle to understand uh, the whole world of ideas of Belgrade surrealism. I, hope that we are on a way to, to do some translations and make it available to a broader audience, first of all, um, researchers of different kind. So here we have uh, 2096 to 1392. Actually, formally as a group of surrealists, they acted from 1930 to 1932. Only two years existed as a group, formally organized surrealist group. But the first surrealist works and activities started in 1926. So this is the period uh, uh, of the active work of this group of 11 young men in their 20s who uh, were experimenting with various literary and visual art techniques and who embraced um, uh, basic tenets of surrealism as expressed by André Breton in his manifest in 1924. So copy of this book of the first edition of the Surrealist Manifest of Breton, only a month or even less arrived in Belgrade <clears throat> to the address of Marko Ristic, Belgrade poet. Um, and of course, he was not, um, it was not by accident, he ordered the, this copy. No, sorry, it was sent by Breton himself, because a uh, few years before, he discovered under Breton, Aragon, Eliar, who were contributing to the avant-garde magazine Literatur, which was uh, published in, in Paris. So uh, this, is, this was a kind of a transitional period from Paris Dada to Paris Surrealism. So ex-Dadaists uh, were looking for a, for a new way, for a way out of the <clears throat> Dadaist project, which was already dead. So, um, so he was familiar. And the other, uh, like Dusan Matic, Alexander Vucho, a group of modernist writers, who gathered around certain magazines were closely attached to French culture. Because you have to know that um, in the uh, First World War, Serbia suffered a lot. And it was occupied by Austro-Hungarian, Germany, and Bulgarian armies. So the Serbian army uh, withdrew through Montenegro to the Albanian coast, where it was uh, accepted by the French who enabled the army to rest and to reorganize. And, uh, but with the army, a lot of civilians were also withdrew from the country. So the army officers and soldiers were taking whole families. So these families were taken um, to France during the First World War, and many youngsters were educated in France. 
from 1915 to 1918. So the whole generation of the intellectuals um, who would become important figures in uh, Serbian cultural and intellectual life between two world wars uh, were French-speaking persons. So these young youngsters uh, discovered modern French literature, and that's how it uh, started. <clears throat> Of course, uh, Paris, after the First World War, were, uh, one was mecca for visual artists as well, and uh, also the generations of not only Serbian, but Yugoslav painters were educated in France. So um, this manifest uh, arrived at Marko Ristic, and um, at the same time they launched a new magazine, literary magazine, uh, Svedočanstva or Testimonies, and in the first number of this magazine, he published a review of um, Breton's manifesto. So that's uh, how it started. And um, of course, um, in the previous years, Dusan Matic, also one of the leading surrealists, studied philosophy in Paris. <clears throat> uh, Alexander Vucho, uh, Milan de Dinac traveled uh, to Paris. And there they met uh, circles around Bertrand, this group of painters, poets, etc., established personal contacts, and they were bringing books, publications, and the exchange was regular. This, for example, Svedočanstva, Ristic regularly sent to Paris, and Breton was sending his publications. So the connection was established, and those in Paris saw in this young group in, in uh, in a, in a Belgrade uh, kind of kindred spirits. And of course, um, uh, that's how this communication was established. Uh, sorry. So in 1930, uh, the group was formally um, organized and um, they printed the almanac called Nemoguće, L'Impossible. It was bilingual, Serbian and French because it contained also, maybe you see uh, the names, uh, contributions from French surrealists. And on the front page, uh, there was a photo by Nicola Vucho, who was a, a very interesting person, brother of Alexander Vucho, but never joined formally to the group of surrealists, but was parallelly experimenting with photography of a surrealist type. And this one is called Sustained uh, Escape of Surreality. It's a double exposure <clears throat> image, and it's a kind of iconic image and a good intro to the world of Belgrade surrealism. And it's not by chance that it opens this uh, magazine, which is um, um, conceived and designed uh, um, uh, like the magazine of French surrealists, La Révolution Surrealiste. <clears throat> Then in 1931 came um, Nadrealism Danas i Ovde, Nadrealism, the Surrealism uh, Today and Here, which marked the second phase of the Belgrade Surrealism. Three issues were published. And uh, beside that, there were books, uh, uh, essays, uh, theoretical works, also published uh, by the same label, uh, Surrealist Editions. So there, there were, uh, <clears throat> uh, they had their own uh, publishing uh, uh, publishing company, and uh, it was all this production was self financed, and uh, it was on sale only in one bookshop in uh, in Belgrade. Um, uh, print run was for that time pretty big, uh, around thousand. Uh, copies. So, um, what is specific about Belgrade surrealism? It's, um, first of all, we have, you have to know that it's a second group, a surrealist group formed after the French one. The first one was a Belgian group formed in, uh, at the late 1924. And uh, in 1930, uh, when the Belgrade group was formed, it was the third group. So the surrealism grew as an international movement in the 30s. In 1932, when Belgrade surrealism was already dead, uh, 
from sorry from 1932 when Belgrade surrealism ceased to exist, it flourished all over the Europe, in Czech Republic, in Poland, in Latin America, in Japan, and now we see in Egypt. So I'd, I'd like to speak about surrealist commonwealth. Yeah, uh, it was the most prominent uh, painterly or literary style in the 30s worldwide. The last avant-garde, the last big avant-garde. The, as Arthur Dento said, the, it was the surrealism closed the age of the avant-gardes in the 30s. So, um, but in a, it also became internationally recognized painterly and literary style. And uh, <clears throat> due to Breton's embracement of all the different currents which called them surrealists, uh, it lost its um, initial <clears throat> initial uh, initial impetus and became more as an artistic style than the avant-garde, uh, strict avant-garde with the program that was in the first period, meaning in the 20s. So uh, it was not possible. Uh, um, to think uh, of Belgrade as surrealism uh, without comparison to French. But there are several differences. First of all, French surrealism grew up, grew from the Dadaism. In Serbia, it was not the case. There was a short Dadaist episode with, in the 1920-21 with Dragan Alexic in Zagreb. But uh, these, uh, these guys who formed this group grew up from the Expressionism, because Expressionism was after World War I the dominant literary and uh, visual art style. And, uh, but then there was a split, of course, uh, of old uh, comrades, because Expressionists were the mainstream, and those who embraced Breton's idea, uh, Surrealists, uh, became the avant-garde, and uh, <clears throat> you had an interesting situation that uh, the clash between Expressionists and Surrealists was very important in the, in the 20s. Uh, which I think uh, ex uh, we cannot find a similar situation elsewhere in Europe. The other thing is that um, this group uh, was publicly known only through the publications I, I presented to you and books. So they never organized any public event, uh, literary soiree, whatever, exhibition, uh, nothing. They were like a closed community, like a secret community, gathering on a daily basis uh, at home, experimenting, working together, writing, discussing, and publishing this stuff. So, <clears throat> uh, for example, visual art production of Belgrade Surrealists was completely unknown uh, at the time. It was only known through reproductions, so published in the magazines, but only a few works were published, uh, until 1969, when the Museum of Contemporary Art in Belgrade uh, uh, organized a, a huge overview of, of Belgrade surrealism, mostly for Marco uh, uh, collection. So it's a, it's a big difference, because it never became commercial. It never went to the market which happened to the French, or Belgian, and other surrealisms. Um, it, uh, they uh, consciously refused to, to, to take part in the literary life or in the uh, artistic life. So they said uh, what they are producing is not literature, is not art. It's an experimentation specific in the surrealist way of discovering hidden areas of human thought and experience. So uh, they never regard it as an art production, and there was no reason for them to exhibit it as an artworks in the galleries on the other places like that. Um, so um, it was a kind of um, home laboratory. Um, they were experimenting, working, enjoying, but they had no urge to show it publicly uh, or to, I mean, the originals. And um, so it was um, after the World War II, it was in Yugoslavia and Serbia known as a literary movement. And the first books and studies about Belgrade surrealism treated it as a literary movement, which predominantly it was a literary movement. 
So in 1969, it was discovered also as a visual art movement. And uh, very soon, in 1971, uh, Patrick Walbert organized a huge, uh, most at that time, most comprehensive exhibition of uh, international surrealism. In, it was in Paris and in Munich. So he visited Belgrade and included, I don't know, 40 works from Belgrade surrealism, which was a, really a breakthrough. And then it became internationally recognized. So in order to, f <laughs> if you like to feel the spirit, how it worked, this is the invitation letter for the first meeting at the house of Alexander Vucho. Uh, when uh, when the group was formed. So it was uh, sent to address of some 15, 16 people uh, in Belgrade. Only 11 of them gathered and that's how the group was formed. But it could be read only in the mirror because you see it's in a, in a reverse. <clears throat> so, uh, um, what is also important to stress is that um, from the very beginning, uh, uh, the literary modernist circles accused uh, Belgrade surrealists that they, are, uh, that they are importing French theory, French art moment, that they are not original, uh, and uh, it does not uh, convey to the local circumstances or etc. But they always said, what are we producing? is the version of surrealism. We are not the same as the French. And uh, Alexander Vucos described it metaphorically in a verse, saying, uh, Slavic soul, French potato. So uh, <clears throat> uh, the whole cultural, social, political, economic context of Yugoslavia of the 20s was completely different from the France. So, uh, <clears throat> The tradition was different, uh, and uh, modernism was undeveloped. So you really cannot um, <clears throat> cannot follow uh, literally the path of Breton and his comrades because it was not possible. On the other side, it was different tradition, different background, different capabilities, because it's important to stress of these 11 people, only one, Radojca Živanović, was a trained painter, academic <clears throat> background. The others? were students of philosophy, law, literature, <clears throat> and that's it. And they were all poets and writers. So uh, <clears throat> they were not skilled artists. And Radojca Živanović Noe did not find <laughs> the best way to express his surrealist period, so he's really unimportant. Uh, he produced several paintings, but they are not uh, something which is representative for, the, uh, for this uh, production. So uh, the other type of experiments were close to the literary experiments. And of course, we know that there are two main techniques employed by uh, Surrealism, it's automatic writing, which is the, <clears throat> the main and the, the key invention by Surrealism and its contribution to avant-garde techniques. And of course, collage, which was, um, <clears throat> uh, which was derived from, from the Cubist collage or Dadaist photo montage, etc., but put into a specific Surrealist uh, poetics. So, uh, in 1926, <clears throat> how it started, Marko Ristic, for the first time, uh, uh, goes to Paris. Not for the first time, but now in this period when he is already a young and formed poet and intellectual. Uh, two years after receiving Breton's manifest, he meets Bre Breton in person in his studio at uh, <clears throat> at the Rue Fontaine in Paris. Um, and uh, then he, he would later in the 60s uh, describe uh, this meeting. I'll go back to, to it later. But of course, uh, there he had a gallery, a surrealist or surrealist gallery, which was opened in Paris. So uh, uh, for the first time um, <clears throat> alive, the works of the leading surrealist painters and uh, was acquainted with this experimental technique. So automatic writing uh, <clears throat> was the 
main uh, invention described, and there was a receipt of how to produce automatic works in the first manifest. And that's, these are the, his first experiments from 1925. Um, you know, practically these are small sheets of, uh, from, the, from the notebook. Um, later, Oscar de Vitro, uh, who will, after the World War II, become one of the leading um, Yugoslav, not only Serbian, Yugoslav novelists and writers, was also uh, experimenting with automatic or quasi-automatic drawing in the Indian ink. But of course, the main experiments, and these are the, the best known internationally, works are photograms by Vane Bor and Marko Ristic. Uh, of, it's a technique invented by Van Men Ray, called rayograms. Uh, but that's, um, you know how it uh, was produced on a photosensitive paper in a lab. You place randomly certain objects. This is a rope, for example, uh, and expose them to the light. So um, it was a kind of um, Bohr experimented also with the broken glasses. And Marko Ristic uh, made a kind of assemblage uh, combining uh, photography and photograph. But as Bohr uh, expressed uh, in, um, in his recollection of this production, which was, uh, these works were made in 1928, um, outside Belgrade in a small town of Vonjačka Banja, where um, Bohr's um, father um, had a sanatorium. He was a famous doctor. So they experimented there uh, outside of the urban life and everything. And uh, he said it's not pure psychi psychic automatism because it, uh, it has a limited control of mind. You're always choosing certain materials in certain positions, how to put them on the paper. But these are important, uh, uh, important uh, <clears throat> experiments because they um, allow them to introduce uh, photography um, in a non-ordinary way, non-representational way. And uh, Bohr produced some 20 photograms and uh, Marko Ristic less. Uh, some 15 at all are preserved, so they they, are, uh, they rank among the best works produced by Belgrade surrealists. The other uh, experimental technique, automatic, based on the idea of automatic writing, was decalcomania. Uh, these are extremely small sheets of paper, like this. They don't resemble works of art at all. They were not <laughs> produced for that purpose. So you put a stain, uh, uh, or you make a stain from uh, randomly spilled Indian ink, then put the other paper, and you have the image, uh, which is non-representational. It's like a Rangan image or some totem-like image. So um, it's, a, it's a pure automatism. It's not at also psychic automatism, but it's because the author uh, has, plays no role. They were all very, very concerned um, what will become the topic in theory in the late 60s by Foucault and Barthes, death of the author. <clears throat> so death of the author was uh, something which they were thinking about because the author for them was connected with um, bourgeois ideology. The author is something which, uh, which was part of the, uh, the way how the bourgeois ideology reproduced itself in the field of aesthetics, in the field of painting and literature. So uh, <clears throat> this was an important technique because it eliminated personal touch. <clears throat> uh, in 1926, Marko Ristic uh, started to um, write his Paris diary. He spent, I don't know, five, six months from the late 26 to uh, spring 27 in Paris. And um, beside from writing uh, a diary, he published <clears throat> much later. Uh, he was also making his visual collage diary, made exclusively from the press clippings 
and images or materials found there on the spot. So <clears throat> it's called La Vie Mobile. Uh, oops, pardon. And um, this one is from 1990, uh, 1939. So after seven years after the surrealist group ceased to exist, he continued occasionally to experiment. And this is probably the last uh, visual art made by any of Belgrade surrealists. And as you can see, it has more of uh, neo-dada or even pop art than surrealism aroma, which is interesting in which direction it would go if he could have continued with this kind of production. But uh, also, uh, uh, in thinking in terms of uh, contemporary art and contemporary genres, we could say that uh, this, uh, this stuff is a f our first examples of archive art. Uh, artists today are working a lot of with the archives, archiving different stuff. So this was a way of archiving because uh, none of this... Uh, uh, also, it's a diary. It's a reminder there of the papers he read, or, or there are, on the other sheets there are 12 or 15 sheets. Uh, there are invitation cards for the exhibitions, uh, tickets for the theater, for the cinema. So, uh, in a way, all the materials uh, he, he would gather uh, while living in Paris were preserved uh, in the form of collage. So, uh, thanks to this archive impulse, uh, Marco Ristic had this whole production has been preserved because the other members did not take care of it. A lot of works have been uh, disappeared or lost, or they were just not interested in preserving it because for them it was just a temporary experiment. Marco Ristic was collecting everything, and thanks to him and his uh, this impulse uh, <clears throat> for preservation of all the material facts of their activity, it is now possible to speak about this visual production. So uh, in, uh, in Breton's studio, he saw so-called um, surrealist wall uh, of André Breton. Uh, it was, a, a, as we know later, it turned out to be a wunderkammer. Uh, the whole studio of Breton was filled with artworks, surrealism, primitive art, everything. And so he started to uh, make uh, his modest version of it um, with the works of Max Ernst, uh, Yves Tanguy, uh, André Masson, Juan Miró, uh, Belgrade colleagues, photos, primitive art, etc. So uh, he completed this wall from the 1927 to the late uh, 60s and now it's preserved as an installation in our museum and probably the first in installation uh, in the Yugoslavat uh, at all. Um, but there's a different uh, approach to collage by Dusan Matic and Aleksandr Vucho who made several collage together. Um, this one is called uh, In Atmosphere of um, um, spring and the youth, and uh, it contains um, rough materials. So Dusan Matic has that predilection for, for materials. In a way, he's very close to a Bataille's concept of landform or base materialism. Uh, he was less operating uh, with, uh, with images as he operated with, uh, with materials, so producing different kind of collage. Uh, this one uh, is close to the idea of poem object, uh, which was conceived by Breton. Uh, <clears throat> combination of poetic uh, work and the visual artwork. So this is untranslatable because it's really a complicated play of words. But it's an example. You will find it also in Milan de Dinac. Uh, one of the important books was a poem, Public Bird, from 1926. So the beginning of Belgrade surrealism. So he illustrated the book with his uh, with this oniric type collage he produced himself, cutting the images from various uh, publications. Or Dusan Matic, this one is from 
uh, Almanac ne uh, Impossible. It's called uh, Muddy Hunt in, uh, in a Clear Water. It's a poem, but accompanying with this college, college work. So, uh, as we all know, that uh, close uh, uh, intermingling of poetic and visual work was crucial for surrealism. And I th there was no uh, modern art movement uh, which uh, made such a strong connection and interdependence between visual art, painting, and uh, uh, <clears throat> and poetry. I saw that uh, catalog uh, today in the bookshop of the of the K K20. Juan Miró's show, uh, Poetry and Painting. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a very good example. If you have seen that show, you will probably get the idea. So, um, uh, uh, visual thinking was at the core of the, of the surrealist uh, poetry. And uh, poetic thinking, it was always, as Breton said, a uh, collision of two images coming from, or juxtaposition of two images coming from different realities. So it's a visual way of thinking, visual way of making poetry. Even if it is automatic text, whether is it a real automatic text or <clears throat> made under control of mind, you're always having the <clears throat> uh, strings of different uh, images. So. Uh, it was very important for, for, for Belgrade surrealists because they were poets. Uh, and uh, so the, um, the experiment in visual art was the materialization of poetry. Uh, as uh, Marko Ristic and Kocha Popovic said, it's a new geometry, physical geometry of poetical thought. So <clears throat> uh, you cannot imagine surrealism without imagery. And uh, that's uh, something which, uh, which was taken quite seriously and further developed by Belgrade surrealists in their own way. So uh, they realized, even later, when, for example, I'll make an excuse, when Mjedrak Protic, director of the Museum of Contemporary Art, who organized that big show in 1969, invited the, uh, most of them who were alive at that moment, they said, why are you making the exhibition? We are not artists, we are not painters, we were poets. This is bullshit, it's an experiment. I mean, what it has to do uh, uh, at, the, at the distinguished museum with such a beautiful painting of great modern Yugoslav artists, it's not our order of things. So they still believe that, that what they produced uh, was not art, but kind of experiment which was <clears throat> uh, going to the areas which has nothing to do with the aesthetic experience. Um, Vane Bor uh, and Marko Ristic were most prolific experimentators in the field of visual arts among this group, and they left uh, quite a lot of interesting works, some of them you have seen. Um, Bor was influenced by Mark Sands' graphic novellas, and it's obvious, and but uh, he used it in his own way. This one is called Beginning of Every Fanaticism, or this one called Memory. Uh, you have some filmic aroma of the expressionist film from the 20s. <clears throat> he was very much interested in film, and uh, you will film the atmosphere of film or cinematic thought uh, is quite uh, frequently present in his collage. Um, this one is the illustration of, it's called Paysage Landscape, but it's a direct uh, illustration of that inner scape Breton insisted when he said that uh, uh, <clears throat> surrealism rejects retinal image and completely is devoted to uh, 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 depicting inner images of mind. So this is a direct uh, answer to this, uh, this dictum. And of course, uh, this one is called Rest at the Monastery, and it's uh, one of the rare comments uh, uh, about the religion from the Belgrade Surrealist. This one is the, uh, well, most known piece. Uh, it's an assemblage by Matic and Vucho, called uproarious marble. 
It was supposed to be part of um, Camera Obscura, uh, but it never, it was never realized. So it, uh, what stayed is this assemblage uh, uh, consisting of three compartments uh, with various materials and stuff. And it's quite enigmatic, uh, enigmatic piece. I mean, uh, there are no marble, uh, um, there are no, uh, there, is, there is no clue how to interpret it. So even one theoretician interpreted as a kind of uh, uh, trying to make a film by other means, you know, like these are filmic images. Um, but anyway, this, uh, this is the piece which is um, in a way iconic and uh, the best piece produced by Dusan Matic and Alexander Vucha. Van Ebor also experimenting with this mobile object. It's a tondo made of wood and in the middle uh, there's a uh, compartment with sand and pieces of wood. So uh, uh, you're invited to turn it and then with every turn the image inside uh, changes. Uh, he was also experimenting with special technique uh, he called papier froissé, which is close to André Masson's frottage, and made several paintings which are all lost. So this is the reproduction from the Almanac of Nemaguche. Uh, he would use crushed pieces of paper, wet, and from that pieces, he glued them on the canvas, made certain shapes, and then paint over them. So uh, he, it was his contribution to uh, experimental painterly techniques which were developed uh, in, the, in the surrealism. Uh, <clears throat> or as Aragon says, uh, these are the ways to go beyond, um, the go beyond painting. Um, of course, uh, uh, Cadavrex key is a parlor game, uh, exquisite corpse, as it translated in, in English. Uh, games were a very important uh, part of the surrealist home activities. Uh, and so they embraced this technique uh, around 1930. So uh, uh, in a, on a piece of paper, each participant draws a portion of figure without seeing what um, uh, was previously drawn, and the result are these childlike uh, drawings, cadaveric skis, and they were produced in 1930 with the participation of André Thirion, uh, which is the only French surrealist who visited Belgrade, uh, uh, traveling to Sofia in order to kidnap his uh, lover, who went to Sof Sofia, and Belgrade surrealists were uh, asked by Breton to give him a support, which which they did, but it's uh, <clears throat> it's the other story, um, and of course uh, this um, Belgrade group has no leader. Andrei Ristić was just a general secretary or a main or Marko Ristić, or general secretary or main organizer. So it was a uh, collective of equals. So uh, that's the, sometimes they, uh, all of them, or most of them, participating in various experiments. And this one is called, uh, uh, just a second, uh, forgot, uh, Charms of Automatism or Seven Minutes of Brilliancy. It was, it's a text, uh, it's a collective text uh, made in the same manner as this cadaveric ski. But what is interesting is how it is done. And uh, Marko Ristic preserved, this, uh, this was found in his archive, a diagram of this seance. So uh, six sheets of paper circle between six participants in the direction of the Earth's axis motion. Each of one of them writes few sentences on each paper without, taking, uh, without knowing what others have written. And as Ristich wrote, this experiment subverts excellence of poetic inspiration and unity of individual thought. So we are again coming to the idea of the death of the author. This is probably uh, one of the best pieces and most intriguing one 
by Belgrade surrealists. It was realized in the third uh, issue of uh, surrealism today and here. Uh, it's called In Front of a Wall, Simulation of Paranoic Delirium of Interpretation. Uh, in the middle, you see the original photo by one Belgrade photographer. It's a, just a simple cracked wall. And then around it, you see simulacrums, uh, interventions of this, on this photo by five Belgrade surrealists. So um, this project was inspired by Dali's theory of, uh, by da da Salvador Dali's paranoid critical method. He explained it in the, his famous article, Rotten Donkey, in 1930, in the mag, published in the magazine Le Surrealisme au Service de la Révolution. So uh, for Dali, uh, simulation was a new method which would replace the passivity of automatic writing, which uh, at that time went into manner, which Breton uh, <clears throat> accepted too and was pretty unsatisfied when seeing painters and writers doing something which resembles automatic writing but actually was under control of mind. So uh, Dali believed that um, uh, this simulation uh, was an active force that leads to the, the realization of the real and the production of a double image. So as paranoia is systemic confusion which leads to a discreditation of the concept of reality, and simulation of paranoia produces the same effect as a real disease. So paranoic delirium is an, itself an interpretation of reality. And was, uh, <clears throat> so Dali was producing probably, you know, double images as a result of this simulation, but they were static. I mean, uh, they were not, uh, you could not understand uh, uh, how he came to this double image, because they were finished. They left no room for the uh, 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 for the for us to to detect uh, how he produced, and that's why to, uh, Sigmund Freud, when they met in London in the 30s, told me, "I'm not." Uh, looking for a subconscious in your images, I'm looking for a conscious. I'm looking for a subconscious in the works of the old masters. But uh, they avoided this mistake because what they did, they left the ori original. <clears throat> and then uh, personal simulacra were like a procession, to quote Baudrillard, uh, were placed around it. So uh, <clears throat> the whole process is visible. Each simulacra is one version. So it's very, um, it is the rare example because, of course, we know from the uh, recent research and the new interpretations and new readings of the surrealist uh, art that the birthplace of modern simulation art is exactly surrealism. But this is completely different from Magritte, from Dali, from other surrealists, which are well known as a key figures of the birth of the simulation art, this is completely uh, different, uh, different approach. Of course, Marko Ristic made a comment and explained it uh, on the next page, but saying this is not art. It, ha it has no means in itself. It's just an experiment and uh, showing us how this simulation can work and produce something uh, which is close to a uh, paranoid uh, delirium. And then he uh, also experimented with uh, simulation of <clears throat> with paranoid critical method in his um, so-called paranoid didactic poem, Turpituda, which he published in 1939 and is illustrated by drawings of the famous Croat painter Krsto Hegedusic. And uh, the topic of this um, the central motive of this uh, poem was lycanthropy, psychological syndrome that involves the delusion of the affected person who thinks that he can transform into a wolf. So it was accused for, for being a perverse and it was banned 
<clears throat> like most of the surrealist publications I'll come back to later, it was under censorship as un unmoral and it was practically destroyed. So this what you see, only one or two copies survived. And this is the reprinted edition from 1970 or something like that. So, uh, but it's not you know, art production. It's not only poems and literary experiments. Um, the surrealism played, we know it today, a very important role in the history of progressive ideas in Serbia and Yugoslavia. Because it not, uh, it, for example, it introduced psychoanalysis. Um, it was more or less the same situation as in, in Paris, because uh, historian of French psychoanalysis, Elizabeth Rudinesco, wrote a book where she speaks about two channels of the reception of psychoanalysis in France. One was literary, the other one was medical. But as we all know, in, in France, psychiatry was very strong. And it resisted because psychoanalysis and Freud um, changed in many ways uh, uh, the knowledge about uh, uh, mental illness uh, from that one that was uh, inherited from psychoanalysis, uh, from psychiatry. So uh, f the best uh, reception of Freud's ideas in France came through literary circles and especially uh, Breton, even the term autom automatic writing or auto psychic automatism was taken from uh, Freud's rare reading of the psychiatric notion of uh, psychic automatism. So uh, the same was in Serbia. The first, um, uh, all the Belgrade surrealists when visiting Paris were always going to a clinic of Saint Anne where Georges Dima, a famous psychiatrist, were giving lectures. So I attended these lectures like other people from Paris. We know that Sartre, Lacan, Claude Lévi-Strauss, everybody was there. Uh, they were quite popular. So they were interested in uh, uh, mental illnesses, but of course, discovery of Freud. And they were able to read it in French and especially in German, because most of them had also a good command of German. Uh, uh, led to a um, kind of um, um, effort to join dialectical materialism and uh, psychoanalysis. Uh, so we could say that surrealists, both in France and in Serbia, were the pioneers of a syncretic theory of Freudo-Marxism. Um, it's a very long and complicated, theoretically complicated story to discuss it now. But uh, <clears throat> uh, in 1930, uh, psychoanalytic society in Serbia was uh, first uh, founded in 1938. 12 years after the foundation of psychoanalytic society in Paris. And they had no ideas. They were completely ignorant uh, about many important texts published in surrealist magazines about their view on uh, uh, their introduction of psychoanalysis into, into, Serbian, uh, into Serbia. So, um, of course, they rejected Freudism and, and as an idealist philosophy and uh, embraced only psychoanalysis as a method. So it was the same approach as Breton and the others have in France. Uh, but what they did was trying on a theoretical level to uh, make psychoanalysis a method within the dialectical materialism. So we are coming to this important point. This is the political engagement. Um, in 1926, when uh, Ristich met Breton, in Paris, he told him that he was thinking about joining Communist Party of France. He told me uh, surrealism cannot do it, cannot fight uh, alone. So our natural ally is organized communism. And uh, when Ristich asked him, how do you see the place of surrealism within the organized communism. He said, organized communism, communist party is a big river. Surrealism is a small river. 
it flows into it and continues to flow together with it, but without losing its identity. As we all know from the history of surrealism and many books written about it, it was not possible. From the very beginning, they entered, Breton and few of them entered 1927 into Communist Party of France. There were problems, <coughs> misunderstandings, because they were not ready to renounce their surrealist activities, their way of thinking, of writing, painting, etc. So, uh, as Breton said, we were not uh, eager to accept control of mind imposed by Communist Party officials. So, of course, um, the, the final uh, <coughs> moment of this unstable marriage between surrealism and communism in France came in 1932 with the affair Aragon, when Aragon changed the side, we all know that story. And uh, <clears throat> from that moment on, uh, Breton uh, continued with his own uh, leftist politics, with his own uh, political engagement, uh, without any connection with the uh, Communist Party. In Serbia, in 1930, when the Belgrade Group was formed, uh, it was the moment when Breton, as a kind of um, gesture towards Communist Party, decided to change the title of the surrealist magazine, La Revolution, Surrealist Revolution, into a surrealism in the, in, in the service of the revolution. So uh, <clears throat> that's happened uh, also in Belgrade. Instead of impossible, surrealism today and here. And it was, <clears throat> uh, it was also a uh, result of the split um, within the Belgrade group on the future of, of, the, of the surrealism in Serbia. So, uh, when they started, as George Kostic recalled in his memoirs, uh, said, we were people who were dreaming about revolution. And that's what this tract, position of surrealism, you have the English translation of it, uh, demonstrates. Um, we were dreaming of communist society, but we had no idea about organized communism. Communist Party of Yugoslavia for us was a complete mystery. We had no any kind of relation. Of course, at that time, there was a dictatorship in Yugoslavia imposed by King Alexander, and it was a strong censorship. So uh, any publication containing word like revolution, communism, or etc., would be uh, censored. So this was Although they tried not to mention directly Marx or Engels or anything, uh, Senzo found certain sentences as disturbing, calling for a revolution, so it was banned, uh, this, this small booklet. Uh, so uh, that's the period. In 1931, younger surrealists, uh, Kostic, Jovanovic, uh, and uh, Davicho, uh, demanded more open political engagement of the group. Ristich and the older ones, <laughs> older, we say older, they were four or five years older, uh, thought that uh, Belgrade Surrealists uh, should be transformed into a movement and gather new, new people, new artists, and uh, uh, come, from, uh, come out from the self-imposed isolation, from that kind of laboratory work. But the others, uh, uh, soon joined, uh, established contacts with the Communist Party, became activists, uh, and uh, thought that it is really, for surrealism, it's better to put itself into concrete party work without losing its identity. So they believed uh, they have the same naive belief as Breton said when he joined Communist Party. So this happened a few years later. Uh, and, um, of course, um, it did not work. In 1931, Kocha Popovic and Marko Ristic published a um, draft for the Phenomenology of Irrational, which is really an extraordinary philosophy book, book of philosophy. It joins together dialectical materialism, psychoanalysis, Dali's theory of simulation, uh, uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, uh, theory of humor, of poetry, and surrealism. 
it's a kind of a syncretic book, but it's really great. It's a, it's for me, it's uh, the most important philosophical book uh, that appeared in Yugoslavia before the World War II. And uh, definitely out of anything that French surrealists produced. Because Kocha Popovic studied philosophy in Frankfurt. So they were very well acquainted with the Western Marxism and the current thoughts. So, uh, but this is not a book which directly makes propaganda of Marxist thought. It's a kind of syncretic worldview because phenomenology, it has nothing to do with Husserl or Wittgenstein or the phenomenology as a school of thought in philosophy. It's, uh, it was very popular at that period, but it's phenomenology of irrational. So uh, the notion of irrational here has a special importance. For example, Breton never speaks about irrational. He speaks about subconscious, Etc. But they found the irrational as a uh, term which can connect idealist and materialist aspects of philosophy. And it's a very complicated system to explain it now. But it was a really a great book. Uh, it has been soon translated into, into French. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, clash started around the publication of this book because this younger guy said it's too esoteric, it has nothing to do with proletarian and revolutionary movement, it cannot serve the revolution. So, <clears throat> on the other side, uh, sorry, on the other side, uh, literary life in the 30s uh, in Yugoslavia, not only in Belgrade, was marked by the so-called conflict on the literary left. Like elsewhere in Europe, after the Kharkov Congress in 1930 and the declaration and the big pressure of third international on communist parties around Europe uh, to control literary life and use literature as a means of communist propaganda, uh, four years later, uh, mm, it was defined doctrine of socialist realism as obligatory uh, for all proletarian and revolutionary writers. So this hardcore Kharkov line, the first uh, target of their attack was surrealism, as decadent, as, uh, uh, although they uh, regarded them as political allies, knowing their com communist affili affiliations, they said you should renounce this decadent way of thinking and put your art into a service of revolution, meaning uh, it, use uh, realist language. And um, of course, there were accusations that that's, um, and it produced fantastic polemics. The last two issues of surrealism here and today are full of texts uh, which are on a high intellectual level answering the attacks from the uh, social uh, writers who had plenty of magazines, because at that time, uh, because of the censorship, communist ideas, uh, uh, it was impossible to, to, uh, to promote them uh, through newspapers or some other magazines. So under the form of literature and literature, literary debate, it was possible to place these ideas. And after two or three issues, the magazine would be censored, and then they just launch a new one. And that's how it worked. So uh, the, it was a, a huge group of writers and painters, etc. So it was really a battle about uh, which is the political and the uh, linguistic orientation of uh, uh, this kind of literature, which was called social literature, which was cryptonym for proletarian and revolutionary literature, as it was called elsewhere. And uh, in the 30s, uh, there were various debates, but uh, one, the fiercest one, uh, took place around Belgrade surrealism. And uh, it, in a way, resembles the debate you had here in Germany between Gerd Lukács, uh, who was defending <laughs> the doctrine of realism as the only possible in the service of the revolution, 
and on the other side Brecht and Bloch and Adorno, etc. So it was between realism and expressionism. Uh, here it was bef between realism and so uh, social literature. And um, so um, they said, well, uh, dialectical way of thinking is not a realist style in a manner of Tolstoy or Dostoevsky. Dialectical way of thinking is surrealism. It's a montage. So uh, as an answer on these attacks, they published this uh, montage of report photos from the various parts of the world. It's called Instead of Social Art. So it was their answer to the doctrine of socialist realism, saying, listen, uh, these documentary photos showing disastrous terror around the world at that time uh, put into a such juxtaposition speak more and more directly than one isolated photo. So uh, Marco Ristic um, even started in Paris to write his PhD dissertation called Metaphysics of uh, Press News, which was uh, republished, this part he wrote. And it's a first example of the theory of media in our country. It's really in interesting how he analyzing the role of media and media messages in the society of the 20s and the 30s. So um, <clears throat> this is uh, something which is against the uh, metaphysics of, uh, of uh, media, <clears throat> of uh, press uh, messages. So uh, it was unbearable in 1932 because um, these younger members uh, left surrealism and devoted complet completely to party work. And first, Oscar Davicho was arrested, then the others. <clears throat> um, and uh, at the end of 1932, Vane Bor and Marko Ristic published the last book, the last publication of Bargrad Surel is called anti Zid or anti Vol. Contribution to a more correct understanding of surrealism. It's a whole history and philosophy of surrealism, both French and Serbian. From the very beginning, from their references, their influences, back to the 19th century, etc., etc. <clears throat> and of course, it uh, it's, uh, ends with, uh, with the attack on social literature and still defending the idea that surrealism is the best vehicle for uh, uh, applying uh, tenets of dialectical materialism into a visual art. So it's deliberately printed in red, and this antecedent <coughs> resembles anti-deering by Engels. Uh, so it's the, it's the testament of Belgrade surrealism. It's the end. And uh, in 1933, uh, uh, the last mention of Belgian surrealists appeared in uh, uh, Le Surrealisme Service de la Revolution in a text by René Crevel uh, saying Yugoslav surrealists are in prison, which became true and uh, several of them half of the group, not only this hardcore group, but the others were occasionally under arrest and persecuted for the communist activity. So, uh, what was they doing was to broke down the walls of bourgeois rationalism, of the system, of the order, of everything. And now they face the wall of communism. They were all devoted communists, but there is this uh, photo called The Wall of Agnosticism by Nikola Vucho, which was published in, in Impossible, in magazine Impossible. And it turned out that this image is a kind of a perfect illustration for the end of the surrealist project in uh, Serbia. What happened is that several members of the group joined social literature and became uh, uh, exponents of it, completely forgetting his their surrealist part. But Vanibor stayed surrealist, and uh, 
Marko Ristic and Dusan Matic still made some literary and artistic works in a surrealist manner in the 30s. And uh, in 1939, uh, he was even accused in uh, attacked directly by Josip Broz Tito, at that time general party secretary, that he is spreading Trotskyist ideas. Uh, because uh, a year later, uh, before Breton met with Trotsky in Mexico, you know that story. So anybody connected with surrealism was automatically connected with uh, <clears throat> Trotskyism, which was, uh, of course, under the pressure of Moscow and the Third International, which uh, was suggesting all the communist parties to uh, uh, unite their ranks, and everybody who was against was more or less accused of Trotskyism. So, um, but what happened uh, afterwards is that um, all of them uh, played important role in a socialist Yugoslavia. Korcha Popovic, for example, you know, the one who co-wrote this uh, draft for the phenomenology of irrational, became uh, Tito's main general in the national liberation struggle in the Second World War and won some, won some uh, important battles during the, against the Nazis in 1943 and 44, and after the war became a F Yugoslav Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs. And Marko Ristic was in 1945, although unsecure what will happen to him in 1945, because he did not join the partisan movement but stayed at home, but Tito uh, sent him promptly to Paris as a first Yugoslav ambassador, ambassador of the first of the new Yugoslavia, and the others also became um, professors, uh, uh, um, public figures, uh, writers, etc. Influential figures who played an important role in the modernization of Yugoslav society and culture in the 50s and the 60s, except except uh, Vane Bor, who ex escaped to England in 1944 and stayed there to the rest of his life, and uh, George Ivanovich and uh, Noe, Noe Zhivanovich, who were killed during the war fighting for partisans. So, uh, uh, the episode of Belgrade surrealism uh, is not only a... It has... Uh, is not only... The Belgrade surrealism has several episodes. Well, there is this proto-surrealist period from 1926 to 1930, uh, as I would like to call the period of incubation, where they were slowly accepting ideas and experimenting, producing first work. Then the formal duration of the group, 1930-1932. There is this post-surrealist period for some of them, and of course, there is a period after the Second World War uh, where their ideas and their knowledge was applied in a completely different manner in a, in a new society they dreamt of, socialist Yugoslavia. So that's the reason why I prefer to speak of Belgrade, not of Serbian surrealism, because they really do not feel members of nation. Uh, they embraced the ideology of Yugoslavship. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, so, uh, in many of their texts and debates, they mocked uh, Serbian tradition, identity, etc. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, they preferred to be called Belgrade surrealism instead, Belgrade instead of Serbian surrealism, and that's why we are call we are speaking about Belgrade surrealism. Um, this is a short intro and short run through this um, laboratory of ideas and a very complicated word. Uh, believe me, there's much more to tell, but uh, I hope that I managed to, to inform you about the basic stuff connected to this. So if you have any questions, any comments or whatever, please.